All right, guys, let's go ahead and get started talking about Unit 5 solutions. Please have your note packet out, and at any time, you're welcome to pause this video to take notes, or there should be an instructor in your room. You're welcome to pause and ask the instructor questions if you have any while we go along. So that's the great thing about the video. Don't forget that you can pause, rewind, fast forward, do what you need to do to get and understand the content and material. We're going to be talking about mixtures in this lesson. Now, a mixture is something that has a variable composition. So if you look here, here is something that has a variable composition. You look at what it's made out of. There's two different things that it's made out of. So the composition of the mixture may vary. However, the compounds in the mixture always have the same composition. Uh, so you can see here that there's a bunch of green particles and there's a bunch of orange particles here. Now, there are three types of mixtures you need to know about. There's homogeneous mixtures or mixtures that have the same appearance and composition throughout. Think about the term homo and where you've heard it before. Homo means the same. Hetero, on the other hand, means different, and heterogeneous mixtures are ones that contain regions that have different properties from other regions. And finally, there are pure substances which always have the same composition. Now, I'll go more in depth on these individually. So homogeneous mixtures, are, again, are the ones that have the appearance and composition that is the same throughout. If you look over here on the right, here's kind of a good image of a homogeneous mixture. Now, that doesn't really look like the composition's the same. It doesn't really look very even, but it is. I mean, life isn't perfect. You're going to have mixtures that um, are, are going to be a little scattered like this, but as long as is the unit, the the mixture is uniform throughout. You can see these blue particles kind of are uniformly placed throughout. We have the yellow particles are uniformly the same composition throughout. Uh, I'd be getting about the same amount of blue and yellow down here as I would up here. So that's a homogeneous mixture. A couple examples of homogeneous mixtures are alloys. And now an alloy is a mixture of metals like brass. Another type of homogeneous mixture is a solution such as air. Air, I mean, if you look at air, air is made up of oxygen and a lot of many things that are combined together um, pretty evenly or homogeneously throughout, and therefore they are a homogeneous mixture. The other type of mixture is heterogeneous, hetero again meaning different. So heterogeneous mixtures contain regions that have different properties from other regions. So here's an example of a heterogeneous mixture. Uh, you can see that there's it's not really spread evenly between the purple and the green. The green kind of clumped the lower left, the purple clumped the upper right. There's definite regions here, and these regions have different properties from one another. Finally, pure substances. Now, pure substances, they always have the same composition. Uh, sometimes I don't think of pure substances as mixtures, but they kind of tell us what a mixture almost tends to be. Um, so pure substances are either purely elements, purely compounds, or purely molecules. So if you look down here, here's a couple examples of pure substances. So right here, this is a pure substance of the green particle. Here's a pure substance of the purple particle. Now, if you were to mix those two things together, if you mix pure substances together, you'd get something like this heterogeneous mixture here. Water is a good example of a pure substance, and we're talking about pure water, uh, water that's just purely H2O particles. So if it's just H2O particles that exist inside like a beaker or a cup, that's a pure substance. It's purely made of water, of a water compound or a water molecule. Air, we just talked about how air is a mixture. You can separate that mixture into pure substance. So it's almost like working backwards. We have our mixture and you can separate that air mixture into things such as oxygen and nitrogen. So mixtures can be separated into their individual pure substances. So here's a great example. Uh, this isn't in your notes, but you can kind of draw it off to the side if you want. Three of these are pure substances. A, B, and C are pure substances. A is, if you were to almost think of this as looking down into a beaker, this is a beaker full of just one type of atom. So these are atoms of an element, and this is a pure substance. B is also elements. So here's elements that are one thing. We consider these one piece, even though they're made of multiple of the same piece. This would be like oxygen almost. So oxygen is O2 and O2 and O2. And this beaker is purely made of the same thing. That's something with the same composition throughout. So here is the third example here. Um, this is a molecule. And this molecule, you can see it's repeating itself multiple times. So this beaker has the same molecule in it multiple times. So this is also a pure substance because it always has the same composition in it. 
Finally, D is an example of a mixture. It's not a pure substance. It's a mixture, probably a heterogeneous mixture because there's definite regions here. You can see that there's kind of these yellow particles that exist over here. And if there's kind of some, some regions, it's kind of hard to tell with so little information, but this is a mixture, not a pure substance. And you can separate this mixture into its pure substances. So next we're going to talk about how to separate mixtures because, I mean, that's what we want to do. If we have a mixture, sometimes we need to get it down into its pure substances. So one of the ways to do that is through distillation. Now, distillation is a method for separating the components of a mixture um, by using the physical property of boiling points. So here's an example of a distillation apparatus where you usually take your liquid, your solution, um, your liquid mixture that you're trying to separate and you heat it up. Now, because certain things have lower boiling points than others, those things will rise up uh, and then they go through something called a condenser. And this thing kind of cools down. If you think about the word condense, it takes the, the liquid vapor and condenses it or cools or slows the molecules down back into liquid form where they're collected over here. A great example of this is the distillation of crude oil. So you can use distillation, or I guess they do use distillation, to separate crude oil into individual par parts. And these individual parts are called fractions. So they'll take the crude oil, put it down here, and that's this crude oil has lots of different types of oil in it. But when they boil it or get it really hot, they can separate it based on the different boiling points. They can separate out the diesel and the kerosene and the gasoline and the different types of bottled refinery gases. And it just all depends on the different boiling points. Some of them have lower boiling points than others. Filtration is another method to separate mixtures. Uh, this method is a method for separating the components of a mixture containing a solid and a liquid. So if you have a solid and a liquid, right, a mixture of water and, sa and sand per se, what you can do is use some filter paper. So this is kind of a close-up picture of what filter paper actually looks like, kind of a diagram per se. Um, and you can see filter paper kind of has little small porous holes in it. Now, if you have a solution that's even smaller than the holes, that'll go straight through. But the larger particles or the larger solid particles will stick in, into those filters, into the filter pores or into the filter itself, and they won't be allowed through. So that's what's happening right here with a filter paper as the particles of sand and water go through. The small liquid particles are able to fall through while the solid particles get stuck in the filter. So kind of an example of this is we could take a solution of sand, water, and salt, and we could basically separate this mixture into different parts using both distillation and filtration. So if you think about it, you know, I challenge you to think about what you would do to do this. Uh, as I go through, you can pause the video if you want to kind of guess per se, um, and then play it when you're ready. So I'm going to go ahead and just tell you right now. What you would do is first filter this so filter this solution or this mixture, and by filtering it, you could separate out the solid particles from the liquid or the smaller particles. So the sand would be filtered out from the salt and the water, which being smaller than the filter paper would just kind of sink on through. Now, what would you do next? If you said distillation, you'd be right. Now, distillation, the next step, based on different boiling points, the water and the salt would be separated from the mixture, water having a lower boiling point than salt, so it would be able to be distilled out. I want to talk a little bit about a couple more types of, of mixtures. These are special types of both homogeneous. These fall into the category of homogeneous and heterogeneous, but I want to talk about what a suspension and a colloid is. Now, a suspension is a mixture that has a Basically, they're composed of larger particles than those found in solutions. By the way, I realize that these aren't in your notes, but go ahead and you might want to write this down or follow along anyways, because this is something you do need to know. Um, because these suspensions have larger particles, these can float around, but eventually will settle out of the solution. Now, what we mean by that is think of like a big jar full of dirty water, you know, it's just kind of dirt or muddy water. If you kind of shake that water around, the dirt gets all mixed up. But if you leave, leave it to settle over time, uh, what's going to happen is it will settle out. Coiloids, on the other hand, are a little bit different. They do have some large particles, but these particles won't settle out. Milk is an example of a colloid. Milk has little fat globules that uh, hang around the, the liquid portion of the milk. Um, you know, you think about what 1%, 2% is. And what happens is, is if you try to filter, it won't filter very well. And in fact, if you shake it or set it down, those fat globules will stay suspended and they won't settle out.
the last useful thing I want to talk to you about is something called the Tyndall effect. Now, this is kind of a tool that scientists use to, to, to distinguish between suspensions and colloids. So if you see here, we have two different um, glass bottles. These are like drinking bottles or uh, glasses or per se. And what happens is, is you can, this person, the scientist is shining a laser pointer through each of the solutions or each of the mixtures here. Now, notice you can actually see the beam through one of the mixtures, but you can't see it through the other. This is the Tyndall effect. Now what's going on here is that this mixture right here, it could be a suspension or it just could be a regular kind of just a, a either a homogeneous mixture or either a pure substance. And notice that you don't see the light shining through it. Now this one over here is definitely a colloid. Tyndall effects help us determine what colloids are. Because there are particles that don't settle out and kind of stay suspended in a colloid, what happens is, is as the light from the laser pointer goes through the mixture, it hits those suspended particles and gets scattered. And that's why you can actually see the light through it. So the Tyndall effect is a great way to distinguish the difference or to actually see and tell whether something is a colloid or a suspension or a pure substance. Uh, well, mo mainly a colloid. It shows us where colloids are. The last thing I want to talk to you about is how to actually make a solution. Uh, and we're talking kind of a little bit about the definitions behind solutions and mixtures. So let's talk first about what a solvent and a solute is. So a solvent is a material that the compound is dissolved into usually water. So the solvent is usually the thing that this, that what you want to mix is being dissolved in. So here we have our solvent. The solute, on the other hand, uh, watch the word, they're very close to one another, is the material that is being dissolved. So we take the solvent water, we have the solute, this powder, could be green Kool-Aid, um, green, the, the sugar part, and then you put it in and you make a solution. So a solution is a mixture basically of a solvent and a solute. Now when describing solutions, the compound that is present in the largest amount is the solvent. So like we said here, usually water. And the other components, and it could be more than one, are the solutes. So that's how you kind of distinguish between the two. Let's talk about dissolving a little bit. So when you dissolve material, so when material dissolves in another, what's happening there, the, the reason that's happening, it's a function of their electrical attractions. Um, so you might have talked about how certain particles, molecules per se, have um, you know partially positive or partially negative ends. And these partially positive, partially negative ends or polarity of these particles cause them to be electrically attracted to the solute. So the solvent is electrically attracted even slightly to the solvent. So chemical reaction is not taking place when things are dissolving. That's a common mistake students think are happening because, you know, particles are being taken apart. Uh, they think that a chemical reaction is taking place, but it's actually not taking place. Because you're not forming something new, per se, there's no chemical reaction there. So the stronger the electrical attraction, the easier it is to dissolve something. That's why certain things are able to dissolve faster or better in other things. And it usually deals with the electrical attraction. So just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about here, here we have kind of uh, dissolving over time. So in this first speaker here, what happened is, is somebody threw some salt inside water. So you can see here, here's our salt particle, the sodium chloride cube right here at the bottom. And water is up here. Now, if you look here, water Water actually is pol polar. It has a partially positive end and a partially negative end. It doesn't necessarily have a full-on charge, but it does have a partial charge. Now, each end of the partial charge will be attracted to each part of the sodium and the chloride ions, uh, sodium being positively charged, chlorine being negatively charged. So even though the compound itself is has, has no charge, um, each piece, each ion in there is partially charged. So literally what's happening is, is the water molecule is coming and kind of tearing and pulling apart piece by piece the ionic compound of sodium chloride. So that's what's happening here. And eventually it's all dissolved. So it all deals with that electrical attraction and kind of pulling it apart. 
Now, not everything can get dissolved. Now, I don't know if you've ever had hot chocolate before, but I don't know if you've ever been like me and you just love hot chocolate. So you go to make hot chocolate, you get the water, you boil the water, put it in the microwave, and you think, hmm, I want this to be really chocolatey. Um, so if you've ever done what I've done and you've just taken scoopfuls and scoopfuls and scoopfuls of that chocolate cocoa mix and toss it in your drink and into the water, again, that's a solvent. The water's a solvent. The cocoa mix is the sol solute. Toss it in there. You mix it, mix it, mix it. Um, sometimes there becomes a point where you can't mix in it anymore cocoa mix. And in fact, usually when you drink it and you get down to the bottom, there's kind of a gloop of undissolved cocoa. Uh, and that deals with the amount of solute. Sometimes if you have too much, there's a limit to the amount that actually gets dissolved, which we want to talk about that. So that deals with something called unsaturated versus saturated. Now, if you have an unsaturated solution, the solvent can hold more solute. You can actually put more into it. So in my analogy, that'd be like you have water and you put like a scoop full of chocolate mix in there. You can actually put more and it will all be dissolved. And that's kind of what's going on here. We have our solute. 30 grams of sodium chloride, you put it in water, and if you look in the bottom, it, nothing's happening. You can actually add more and it'll be fine. Saturated solution, on the other hand, you can't add any more solute um, because if you do, it actually won't dissolve. There's not enough electrical attraction. Everything's kind of being used up there. So if you try to put more into it, instead of becoming dissolved, it will kind of sink to the bottom. So that's where if you add too much hot cocoa and try to mix it, it won't mix anymore. And it will just kind of congeal on the bottom there like this. This is what we say is saturated. It's kind of the perfect amount. This is the exact point where it will no longer be dissolved. There are ways you can speed up dissolving time. There are three ways we want you to know. The first one is to stir the solution. I mean, this seems kind of obvious, but what's happening is when you stir a solution, you cause those molecules, those electrical attractions to collide more and that, that you know they're able to meet each other more often. So that's what's going on here. The other option, you can heat up the solution. That causes the molecules also to collide faster because what happens when you heat things up, uh, the molecules move faster, they run around more, and they're able to do more things because they're moving faster due to the kinetic molecular theory. And finally, you could increase the surface area of your solute. And what we mean by that is literally just break it apart. Instead of tossing a huge chunk in there, if you just had one big chunk, it has a smaller surface area. But if you break it apart, you have a lot more surface area because you have a lot smaller pieces that are able to be dealt with. So that's the last way to speed up the dissolving time. Move. That's it for the notes today. Thank you for dealing with me and your note packet. Again, if you have any questions, I, I recommend either watching maybe parts of this video again or seeking other resources. Don't forget you should have an instructor in the room. You can pause the video. You can rewind. You can always ask questions. Talk with each other. Good job, guys. Keep it up.